Welcome to It Is What It Is. I'm Shaw Marie. Welcome to a beautiful, windy Tuesday in Idaho Falls. It's beautiful, super windy. My 30th birthday was yesterday. It was awesome. Went on a little nature walk with my family, gimping along like I do since I'm all fucking gimped out now. I walk kind of like with a gangster lean, totally not intentional, but like I do, I got like some swag to it. I, I, I make it look good, but it was fun. We, um, just purchased a rooftop tent for my Toyota. And so we're going to do a bunch of outdoor camping and shit. So I'm super, super stoked and it's going to be super, super fun. And if you don't know what a rooftop tent is and you are into outdoors and what not have you look into them and they are just amazing literally set up and take down of this tent under 10 minutes great shit top notch and it's huge i have a family of four and like we're going to be able to fit comfortably in this bitch for days it's huge so anywho that's what I've been doing. And that's why you didn't get an episode on Sunday is because I was just busy hooting around with my family, enjoying the summer days. But back to this, get let's get serious about it. So today I'm going to tell you guys about Charles Pazram. Pazram? He has a dumbass last name. Pazram? Sorry if that's your last name. It's not dumb. But it's hard to say. Yeah. Anywho. So I'm going to tell you this first part is in his own words because he did write an autobiography and it's like 145 pages. I printed off like the first 35 because it takes me a second to read. And so the first little bit is from his own word. And then I just reference Murderpedia and Wikipedia, all that fun shit throughout the rest. Because like I said, I went, I went camping. So any who's it? let's get to it. So he was born on June 28th, 1981. His whole name is Charles, a.k.a. Carl Pansram. So there you go. And he was born in East Fork, Minnesota. And he is one of five children, four boys and one girl to John and Matilda. His parents were East Parisian immigrants. They lived on a farm at a very young age. He said he felt odd. And at the age of five or six, that he was a liar, a thief and mean as hell. He said, and I quote, I've been a human animal since I was born end quote. His parents broke up when he was about seven or eight years old, give or take. And he said, quote, the old man pulled out one day and disappeared. That left his mom and the other family of six, including herself, to manage the farm that was already unmanageable with all of them working together. It was still very hard to keep up with this farm. And that once his older brother's got older they left the farm behind one of his other brothers does die and so that just leaves him his sister and an older brother and the mom him and his sister went to school during the day and then when they got home they would work from sun up to sun down he said he was paid in plenty of hard work and a sound beating every time he looked cockeyed or did anything that displeased anyone older or bigger than himself he says quote it seems to me then and still does now that everything was all right for everyone else but right or wrong i was still gonna get plenty of abuse everybody i thought was all right everybody thought it was all right to deceive me to lie to me to kick me around Whenever they felt like it, which was pretty regularly. End quote. In 1899, at the age of eight, he was taken to court for drunken and disorderly conduct. And in 1903, he was arrested again and for being a drunken incorrigible. 
And he was around 11 and 12. He was going on to 12. He was 11, but going on to 12. And so he says that at the age of 11 is when a light went off in his little head. And he was like, you know what? Fuck this place. I'm done. I ain't going to do this. Ain't going to do it. So in 1903, when he was 11, he thought to himself, my neighbor over yonder is a rich guy. He has plenty of food. He has plenty of things. I'm going to go rob him. And he steals some cake, some apples, and a revolver from his neighbors. And in October of 1903, he was sent to the Minnesota State Training School. While there, he was beaten, raped, and by the staff members, he was constantly told pretty much God is right. Love God or else we will just keep doing this and wash. If you love God, you will be a good boy. And he was beaten into being a good boy is what they said. And he says that most of his abuse would happen at the quote unquote paint shop. And they called it that because the children would leave there painted with bruises from the head to the, from their heads to their toes. And that he learned his first set of, like, torture skills from this place. And that he got so mad and hated it so badly that he set some of the buildings on fire. And he was told he, he didn't get in trouble. Um, he did that on July 7th of 1905. So he was told by another kid there was, like, Dude, if you just fucking tell them you love God and, like, you found your way and, like, you just lie, they'll let you out of this place. So he does. So in 1906, he was let go from the training school and sent back to his mom's house with $5 in his pocket when he, oh, in a suit. When he got home, the mom took the suit, gave him overalls, and took his money. Oh, no, that time, sorry, that the second time he did that. The first time they gave him $5 and released him, he spent that money on the train and then ate candies. So, yeah, he gives the money to his mom by his teenage years. He was a full-blown alcoholic, and he was always in trouble doing robberies, thefts, whatever. He ran away from home again at the age of 14. He said, I'm sick of this shit. I'm not doing it anymore. I'm leaving again. Hopefully I have better odds. And he got caught <laughs> again. And then a couple weeks after that, he attempted to kill a Lutheran clergy with a revolver at school because that guy was being a dick. And the revolver fell out of his coat. The guy kicked it away. And so... He ran away. He's like, I'm going to be a hobo. I'm going to go live the hobo life style. And when doing so, he traveled by train cars, obviously, because that's what you do. I'm not sure if hobo is the correct word nowadays, guys. I don't know. I'm just, you know, I'm just keeping up with the damn story. So he traveled by train car, right? Well, this one night, he got bored as fuck. And he was like, well, this place is super nice. He had a bunch of hay around. It was warm and they're stopped. And so he's like, cool. So he's walking, trying to find somebody to chill with. He comes across a um, cart. Yep. A cart full of four other gentlemen that were also doing this as a means of transportation. And he's like, hey, guys, I have a super nice warm cart down the way with a bunch of hay and whatnot. Let's kick it. And they were like, show me this. And they, he was like, okay. So he's cute and little and young and precious. And he goes and he shows them. And when they get there, they decide to start gang raping him. And next thing you know, box carts on the move. And so we get gang raped for many, many moon for long hours of time. And this really cements his hate for humanity and hate for everyone. This is when he determines, you know what? Fuck everybody. I'm better off by myself because every time I hook up with somebody or I'm around people, they start using me, abusing me, or fucking me in the butt. Things are bad. So I'm done with people. And so he says, 
after because he gets sent he gets caught right riding the train and he gets sent back to the back to a school and he goes to the montana school montana reform school and he meets there a guy named jimmy benson they both then decide that they're gonna start robbing places burglarizing committing arson through the midwest and then they split up in 1907 okay at the age of 15 god Damn. So at the age of 15, after getting drunken at the saloon in Montana, he decides, I'm going to enlist in the U.S. Army. <laughs> right? Shortly thereafter, though, he was convicted of larceny and sent to prison. From April on 420 of 1908 to 1910, he was at the Fort... Larson's oh, Le oh for fuck Jesus Christ I'm retarded today Fort Levensworth State Penitentiary and that's when he developed a um, hatred for Secretary of War William Her Howard Taft because he approved the sentence and so he later claims this is why he hates him and so after his release and dishonorable discharge, he went back to his career of being a thief and robbin and stealing bicycles. He then stole a yacht and he was caught imprisoning and impersonating multiple people. He served time under different names, different aliases. He in Russ, Texas. I don't know. Oregon, Idaho, a different couple spots all all over Idaho and Oregon, Montana, the Montana State Reform School. He was also, I'll list off all the prisons he went to later. It's a fucking list. It's like seven of them. So he would attack prisoners at these places and escape. Like that was his con. That was his thing. He always told everybody when he got there, like, mess with me, you're going to die. I'm going to butt rape you and you're going to die. And I should say, after his gang raping, he has then developed a taste for sodomy itself. And so that is his thing. He's like, I'm going to start killing, sodomizing, and robbing. Bam, bam, and bam. That's what he enjoyed to do. So he claims in his 1929 autobiography that he kills a bunch more people than they can prove. They're not 100% sure. He did say that he killed a guy and stole $135 from him. In the summer of 1991, he was going by the alias of Jefferson Davies. Keep in mind, he's on the run this whole time. So now he's using the Jefferson Davies and he's arrested in Fresno. And when he was there, he, um, oh wait, shit. Yeah. Anywho. So yeah, he's arrested for stealing a bicycle. Okay. He was sentenced to six months in the jail, in the county jail there, but he escaped after only 30 days. Back in the day, guys, man, I don't think it was hard to escape from jail. Everybody escaped from jail. In 1913, he started going by a different alias, and this time he made up the name of Jack Allen, but no fear. He was arrested, too, in Dallas, Oregon, Oregon, Oregon or Oregon. I hear it both ways. I've always called it Oregon my whole life, but I don't want to be wrong. So I say we're just going to say both. Anywho, and he was arrested there for a highway robbery, an assault and sodomy. And he broke out of jail there after only after two months of his three months jail sentence. And then he was on the run again. And then he started using the name of Jeff Davis. And then he robbed... He was arrested in Harrison, Idaho, and then he escaped that jail, 
and then was arrested again in Montana under the Jefferson Davies name that he was using previous. And he was sentenced to one year in prison for burglary in the Montana State Prison. On April 27th of 1913, using the Jefferson Davies, he was admitted to the state prison in Deer Lodge, Montana. He escaped on November 13th. Within a week, he was arrested again using the name of Jeff Rhodes this time in Three Forks for burglary. And then he was returned to the G Deer Lodge, Montana for an additional year. And then there he was released again on March 3rd, 1970. And on June 1st, he burglarized a home in Oregon and he was arrested soon after trying to steal some of the stolen goods that he had stolen from the home. He was sentenced to seven years in prison in the Oregon State Penitentiary in Salem. He arrived there on June 24th and he said he was, re he got harsh treatment from the other inmates, including beatings, isolation. Um, he said they took it to a whole other level. And he says, quote, he swore, quote, would never do that seven years and he felt defeated and he I defined the warden and all his offensive to and his, all his officers to make me good God cannot speak later that year though he helped fellow inmate Ott Hooker escape from prison while attempting this he was recaptured Hooker killed the fucking warden. So now he has implicated himself in a murder. He said after that, he was brutally punished in the jails. He falsely gave his age at 30 and he said his birthplace was Alabama. And so he said the one thing that is very true from his writings is that he was a thief. He said he was disciplined in Salem again, and some of his discipline included a 61-day stint in isolation before escaping on September 18th, 1970. After two shootouts, he was captured and returned to the prison. <laughs> on May 12th, 1980, he escaped again, swinging through the bars of his cell. And caught a freight train heading east in, he was going by the name then, of John O'Learney and shaved off his mustache. He has a very handsome mustache. He then, he returned to the northwest. He ended up from there going to New York. He got a seaman <laughs> identification card sailing a steamboat and then he stole a steamboat and he got he would park down there at the harbor and he would convince drunken sailors to come to this yacht well yacht boat with him and he would shenanigan them and then he would sodomize and rape them and kill their and then dip their bodies out by the lighthouse so he did that and then he decided you know what fuck this i'm gonna go to peru and then when he goes to peru he starts working at a copper mine and then he goes to chile and he commits a murder there and in August of 1920, he burglarized the home of William H. Tuff in Connecticut. The home of William Tuff, who, like I said, was responsible for his lengthy pres Le Le Leavenworth. Oh my God, I cannot say that word. Leavenworth imprisonment. He stole a large amount of jewelry and bonds. As well as Taft's Colt M. 
1911-45 caliber handgun. He then began a murder spree in New York. And it's though the murder spree spanned eight years. And he literally went from like one side of the world to the next. <laughs> And just literally killed and sodomized. He says, okay, he says that he killed and sodomized the whole time. And that was his thing. He's very, very, very proud of his sodomizing -ness. He's very proud of it, which is weird. So, like I said, he would lure them, the drunken sailors in New York. He would always make sure they were drunk. And then he would shoot them with that pistol that he stole. So he did a run of prison time there. He got caught and did, ow, sorry, six months in jail in Connecticut in 1921. And then he went on a ship to South Africa and... Got into some trouble in there. He was working on an oil rig in 1921. Over there. And he claimed that while he was there. He killed and raped and. Did horrible things to an 11 year old boy there. And that he confessed to this. Murder in his writings. And he said quote. His brains were coming out of his ear when I left him. He was never discovered. Oh, he will never be any. What the fuck? Okay, hold on. Let's reread this. Let's reread this. He says, quote, his brains were coming out of his ears when I left him and he will never be any debtor. Okay, so it did say what I thought. I thought I was fucking that up. Any debtor. Okay. I will keep in mind this is a different time. And so the words must be different. Um, he claimed that he hired six boatmen and started, he said he got these people and then he killed these people and then he fed these people to crocodiles. So really, okay, so really all these murders that I'm telling you about is what he claims. None of them were set in stone. So do not be like, there was no people killed by alligators and pants. I don't fucking know. He just says, okay, I got to make that clear, for, especially for the haters. I have to make that clear. All of what he is saying is speculation. Okay? Okay. So <clears throat> he says after he feeds all these people to the crocodiles, right, he comes back back to the United States where he was arrested for raping and killing two boys. He beat one of them to death with a rock on July 18th in 1922 in Salem, Massachusetts. And he strangled oh, and struggling strangling the other one later on in New Haven after his murder spree in um Salem, he got a job as a night watchman at a mill factory in Yonkers where he made um, sexual, several sexual acquaintances and sexual encounters with a little 15 year old boy named George. Um, so he robbed and raped people again. After this encounter, he steals and he goes to a yacht and he sails. He's sailing, he's sailing. And when he t does this in New Haven, his victims, he, like I said, again, we rob, we rape, we sodomize. And in June of 1923 in New York, he stole another yacht this one will belong to the police chief. Mm-hmm. And he promised him a job. Oh, he picked up a guy. And he promised this guy a job on his boat. 
And that was a lie. There was no job on any boat. He did that so that he can rape him and repeatedly sodomize this guy when he got him out into like open waters. So on June 27th, near the river in Kingston, New York, he claimed that he used a 38 caliber pistol stolen from the yacht to kill another guy who he said he tied him up and on the yacht and threw his body into the river. He then said on June 20th that he and the 15 year old boy that he is still committing more crimes with. Okay. The little 15 year old, I should, guess I should have said that he's still there. He's, he's chilling. We haven't killed him. He's still killed. He's chilling. He's just a part of the shenanigans. So they dock and they steal a hundred dollars worth of fishing nets and in New York, he witnessed a murder. Mm -hmm. The little kid did. The little 15-year-old boy, he went and witnessed a legit witnessed it. Seen it with his own two eyeballs. He jumped overboard and then swam to shore. And then when he jumps overboard and he swims to shore, he goes to the police in Yonkers. And he's like... Just so you guys fucking know, get your jobs in line here. This guy's kidnapped me, sodomized me, put me on a boat, killed a motherfucker. And y'all need to do something about this. Like, now. So. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So then he tells the police, like I said, that he's been getting sodomized and raped by this guy. When they go... They set out on alert and he, for Captain John O'Leary, on June 29th, he was arrested in New York under that name. On July 9th, which is Thursday, um, he tried to escape from jail. He later gave his lawyer one of the stolen boats as collateral to get him out of jail. Oh my God. On August 26th, he was arrested again. And then he was he got caught breaking into a train depot three days later on August 24th. He was cleared as a suspect in the stabbing death and committed in the north of somebody in Greenberg, New York. Well, he was sentenced... For five years imprisonment there, he then confessed to being, quote unquote, Jeff Baldwin. And then he said that that, quote unquote, Jeff Baldwin was a wanted man out of Oregon. And meanwhile, okay, so when he goes to these prisons, he's like, just so you guys know, I'm wanted at all these different places. I am this other person. All of these people are like, dude, you don't need to lie. You don't need to boast. Calm the fuck down and chill. And finally, he was telling these stories so much, especially about the murders, about raping and penetrating little boys, that the cops are finally like, well, shit, maybe we should, like, check it out. So they do. Anywho. So, God. It just drives me nuts. And so, like I said, in October, he was imprisoned at Clinton Prison in New York. He was let go from there in July of 1928. He says that he committed a murder in Baltimore in the summer of 1928. He was captured again in August 30th, 1928. He was arrested in Baltimore for the robbery, he, a robbery he committed in Washington, D.C., Stealing a radio and jewelry from the home of a dentist on August 20th. During his interrogation, he then confessed to killing three boys earlier that month. One in Salem, one in Connecticut, and a 14-year-old newsboy in Philly. He wrote a letter connecting all these things in his mass killings and says that it was what it was and that he actually did do it. Um, he then told, oh, 
all of the things that he did and they all were finally like, wow, this dude has been killing people all over the fucking place. And it just blows everybody's minds. And in light of his criminal record, they gave him 25 years to life upon arriving in Levin. Oh, God, I have to say this word again. Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary. He was given inmate number 31614. And when he gets there, he says to the warden, eyeball to eyeball, I will kill the first man who fucking bothers me. And upon giving this warning, the warden says, isolation with this dude. Go. Send him to... Do laundry in the laundry room. Well, in the laundry room on June 20th, 1929, he beat the prison laundry foreman to death with an iron bar. And then, of course, he was sentenced to death for that said beating. He refused to have any of his appeals taken through. He did not care. He said, kill me, go ahead. He wrote once, quote, the only thanks you and your kind will ever get from me for your efforts on my behalf is that I wish you all had one neck and that I had my hands around it. Mm-hmm. Smear yes. While on death row, he befriends a guard. His name is Harry Lasser, Henry Lasser, who gave him money to buy cigarettes. And was nice to him, showed him acts of kindness. And once he heard his story, he says, Carl, buddy, let me smuggle you some shit in here. Write your story. I'll put it into a book. Woo witch! So he does. And he details graphically his crimes, his love for penetration of the bum his sodomizing fetish, he says, and he makes it quite clear that he did not repent in any or for any of his robberies, murders, or rapes or arsons that he has ever been involved in. He will not say sorry for any of those things because he does not feel bad about them. And in a straightforward statement, he said, in my lifetime, I have murdered 21 human beings. I have committed thousands of burglaries, robberies, larcenies, arsons, and last but not least, I have committed sodomy on more than 1,000 male human beings. And for these things, I am not one bit sorry. Mmm. I did the mm for like a drop mic effect. So on September 5th of 1930, officers said, today's the day you hang for your crimes. While placing the black hood over his head, he spit in one of the executioner's faces and they said, piece of louthing shit. Do you have any final words to... I guess, make us listen to you since it's our right to give you this. He says, <clears throat> I do. Hurry up, you housard bastard. I could have killed a dozen men while you were screwing around. And right when he said that, they pulled the thing. He fell the five feet and <sniffs> off he goes. His body was never claimed. No one ever gave two shits that this man was killed or put to death. And so his body was then turned over to the Leavenworth Penitentiary Cemetery. And the only thing marking this piece of shit's grave is the inmate prison number, prison number of 31614. And, Kenny, my dear, that is my ideal and my thoughts on Mr. Carl. He's horrible. Horrible. And it's just crazy. They can only prove, like, legitly, they could only prove a couple, like, a handful of what he said actually happened. 
And he goes by the name. Here's a list of the names of the... Um, he died, by the way, at the age of 39. I don't think that matters, but he was 39 years old when he died. His list of alias includes Carl Baldwin, Cooper John II, Harry Pazram, Jack Allen, Jeff Davies, Jeff Rhodes, Jefferson Baldwin, and... Hold on. I lost my damn paper. And Jefferson Davies, Jefferson Rhodes, John King, and John O'Leary. He was active between the years of 1899 and 1929. He has a book, and the book is called Killer, A Journal of a Murderer. So his charges are arson, battery, burglary, criminal possession of a handgun, rape, robbery, and vandalization. And he is sentenced to hang by capital punishment. He committed crimes in everywhere over the United States pretty fucking much. He was, it was Connecticut, Kansas, Maryland, Massachusetts, New York, and Pennsylvania, and Texas. He confessed to killing, literally only killing, 22 men. He can only, they can only confirm five of his testimony. He was convicted and sentenced in up to seven penitentiaries over his lifespan, over his lovely 29 years of life. And those institutions and prisons are... <clears throat> The Clinton Correctional Facility, Levensworth Federal Prison, the United States Penitentiary, Levensworth, Minnesota State Prison, Montana State Prison, Oregon State Prison, Sing Sing Correctional Fossil OT. So, busy, busy guy. Very, 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 very busy. So, yeah. That is the story of this man, of good old Carl. And he's a handsome fella, guys. He's a handsome feller. So, it's a shame that he decided to be a piece of shit and sodomize every man he came into contact with. You did not meet Carl without getting your butt penetrated. You did not. Did not matter who you was if you came across good old Carl. Or any of the other names I listed off, your butt was getting touched. You were getting butt raped and sent on your way or murdered. Depending on how sketchy he thought you was going to be to the situation. And so he's just a horrible piece of shit, guys. Back in the day, this was not... Back in his time spree of 1899 to 1929. Whew! Those are some scary times to be a fella anywhere. And he didn't care. You could have been a soldier. You could have been a mine worker, a child. He just was the worst of the worst. And they say that literally this guy is the definition of America's first shit bag. That's what they say. So yeah, on that note, hopefully you guys, I didn't know about good old Carl. Paz Ram, Paz Ram, Paz Ram, Paz Ram. I didn't know about him. So hopefully you guys didn't know either. So good job, Kenny. Again, good job, dude. This is an awesome one. This dude was a complete shitbag. But yeah, so follow me on the good old social media networks, okay? I got the Facebook. I got the Twitter. I got the Instagram. I even got the YouTube where I put my lovely face on there. And... Do I do videos on Thursday of shows this coming up Thursday. We're going to do a killer couples because I just feel like talking shit on two people instead of one. And then um, at some point in time later, either this week or next week, I'm going to have to do another update on douchebag Lori Vallow for like a smackant because some things have happened for her. And I just really want to see what the state of Idaho is going to do with presenting what they've already said. And then I want to see what the counter offer is and see how this balances out. So 
I will do an update, a live video update on that one when I have more information because like I said, some things have kind of changed. So we'll see what happens. But yeah, so on Facebook, it is what it is, a true crime podcast. That's also my YouTube name as well. On Instagram, it is what it is, pod19, all together, no spaces, no nothing. On Twitter, it is what it is, 208, because that's where I'm from. If you like my podcast, please go to Apple if you have iPhones. Rate my show. I have 42 ratings. I would like to get that up a little bit if I can. Not a big deal. But yeah, so... Yeah, I'll see you guys on Thursday. Have a beautiful Tuesday. Bye, guys.